thanks it would be better if there was a real life one you know on one of those extendy sticks but yeah <laughs> thank you very much for having me along um i've turned on my camera just briefly so that you can see just how dark it is in edinburgh at the moment uh i had a trial run with putting a light on my face so that i didn't look like i was dead but yes hello it is is nice to meet you um and also to have heard an attempt at pronouncing edinburgh it's always a good one. <laughs> um, but yeah, as, as promised today, I'm going to talk through the past, the present and the future of energy justice. Um, but I'll start, I hope, um, by entertaining you a little bit with my career trajectory to date, um, which I was kind of invited to give 10 minutes on. So the first thing I will say um, is that I come from the best country in the world, really. Uh, contentious statement to start off with, but of course, um, unless any of you know Scotland, you won't believe me. Uh, for those of you that haven't been here, I very much invite you to come over when this pesky pandemic um, finally gets gone, basically. Um, so yeah, I'm from the north of Scotland, um, somewhere near Inverness, uh, for anyone who's ventured up that far. Uh, and it's worth saying that I am passionately Scottish and everything that I've uh, done and seek to do is informed by uh, the place that I come from. So that's very much informed my career trajectory and everything that I've sought to achieve. Um, and basically you'll never take me away. So even if this seminar ends with a job offer, I'm not coming, I'm staying home. <laughs> yeah, and I also wanted to break it down, which I, I kind of jokingly mentioned that this at the beginning, but I do think it's quite an underwhelming career trajectory. Um, I'm also a program director of Energy Society and Sustainability course here at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and we have students that come from all over the world having done amazing things. Um, whereas I have stayed quite strictly within academia uh, for a number of years now and gone from one institution to the next. So what I can kind of talk about here is a, an insider's perspective on what it is to be an academic and nothing else at any other stage, uh, and what it is to be kind of a British person through and through. So, as I mentioned, you know, being quite lo loyal to Scotland, I'll start at the beginning and say um, that even at the beginning of my university career, I was interested in energy. Um, I had a, a grandfather who was one of the first people to build commercial uh, wind energy turbines in Scotland, uh, which he did up in the Orkney Isles in north of Scotland. Um, and so I knew that I was vaguely interested in this and that I would probably want to stay uh, in the country as a whole. So I, I ended up picking the University of St Andrews, which if you ever want to look up somewhere beautiful, I very, very, very much recommend looking at photos of. And we have some excellent and weird traditions. <laughs> um, and then, you know, you go throughout your undergrad career thinking, what on earth am I going to do? Um, and I was studying sustainable development in a very, very broad sense. But I began to specialise more and more on the energy focus um, and to be informed by my grandfather's work and my dad's passions. So it got to the end of my undergrad and I had the usual panic of where do I go next? Will anyone employ me? What is the meaning of life? Uh, and it turned out that it was going to be accidental academia. So we have a system in the UK where you can be funded for what we call a one plus three, which is a, a master's program for one year and then a PhD for three, which is very different to the US system, of course. Um, and I was successful in my application for that. So a really quick whistle stop tour through a, a further two degrees at the University of St Andrews, which took me out with a focus on um, energy justice, in particular as a set of literature, um, but also nuclear energy as a system. And this will inform what I talk about later, but I was particularly interested in this kind of notion of whole systems, um, energy justice, and how we can account from the source to the sink of an energy technology to look at uh, social implications across all of those. So yeah, that was the focus of my PhD. And then of course you do another classic moment, um, if any of you go on to study at this level or if any of you already are, which is what on earth will I do, do next? <laughs> I don't think that question ever quite goes away. Um, so I was very fortunate at the end of my PhD uh, to go to a, a very good conference where I met Benjamin Sovacool, who I'm sure many of you will have heard of uh, and many of you will have read his work. He is, as we call him, a bit of a freak, um, but in the nicest way, <laughs> never stops publishing. Um, and during that conversation, the first time I met him, I, I officially asked for a job uh, and it went remarkably well and actually one was given. So that's how I transitioned from my kind of undergrad to the University of Sussex. 
um, and to the Science and Policy Research Unit, which is a pretty famous one if you're looking at anything around socio-technical systems, the intersectionality between the technical and the social worlds. Yeah, and I was there for maybe a year and a half, um, doing some work on a variety of projects. Um, Centre for Research and Energy Demand Solutions was one of them. Um, so we were starting to apply some of this energy justice thinking um, to work there around transport and domestic energy systems. Uh, and to look at cross-cutting themes across both of those in terms of who you're recognising, the different technologies that are coming on board and the social justice issues that cut across them all. And it was a wonderful job. Um, but, and you'll find this as well, if any of you stay in academia, there's a stage in your life where you're working on someone else's project, um, but you want to start working on your own. And so definitely in the UK academic system, there's a, a kind of rumour that if you're stuck in a research fellow position for more than one or two years, it's time to leave. And that I always had in my mind was finding that what we call a unicorn position uh, where you get a permanent job, um, tenure in the US, I guess, uh, and get to settle down and create your own niche. And so my bid for independence came a little bit too soon for my boss uh, when I moved to the University of Brighton and started as a lecturer there um, in human geography. And then the dream happened. Um, and it's always worth keeping that dream in mind, uh, where you ultimately want to be and what you ultimately want to focus on. Uh, and that was coming back home to Scotland and working at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and the picture there is of our law school, which is Old College, one of the most beautiful parts, I think, of our institution. So I've been here for a year, and even if they try to uh, demote me or evict me, I will, I will not go. <laughs> I think this is going to be my home for a while now. So yeah, I guess that's that's basically a trajectory of kind of forging your way through both opportunities and uh, a little bit of clawing to find somewhere to stick um, and to trying to make the academic job something a little bit more permanent. Uh, and I think that's probably an issue that exists both in the UK and the US uh, and certainly beyond. Yeah, and then mentioned in my bio is um, some of this background around what I currently do uh, proud parent to a border terrier being the foremost amongst all of that. Uh, so there he is featured. He is our official program mascot. He has his name and profile in our program handbook and website. Um, <laughs> and if you ever follow me on Twitter and you would like dog spam, then you can also find him there. Um, but yes, so alongside my best dog in the world, um, as mentioned, I am a lecturer at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, doing a variety of things, teaching around science, nature and environment, energy policy and sustainability and energy justice. Um, but I do that alongside working for the Durham Energy Institute as well, um, and energy research and social science. And I hope that energy research and social science is something of a bible for you all. Um, so, run by Benjamin Sovkul as our editor-in-chief, I am the less glamorous, significantly underpaid and undervalued uh, <laughs> managing editor who looks at um, all of the submissions that are coming in. So it might be at the end of your master's or PhDs that you're looking to publish some of your work with us um, and we'll always, always welcome that uh, and be happy to field questions around the publication process. I, you know, also say it is boring. That's where I am to date. Um, but there is hopefully an interesting onward trajectory. Uh, and that's around being a llama farmer. And I'm not even kidding. So if you see me in hopefully 10 or 15 years, I will be with a field of llamas. And maybe not an academic. I might have given it up altogether. Yeah. And this is where I point out the informality that I promised uh, and the type of presenter that I am. <laughs> okay. But yes, on to slightly more academic content. Um, past what I will call Lycan the Llama. Thank you for the thumbs up, much appreciated. <laughs> um, and I promised that I would break this into three different stages, um, do the past, the present and the future. Um, we were talking just before this call that, you know, I'll have my own slight slant on this. Um, I think it would be different from Tony Reams, who I'm sure many of you have heard of, from Benjamin Sovacool, from Darren, uh, Raphael, any other authors that you read. Um, but here it is, my own view on what energy justice is and where it's going next. 
So I'll start by saying, you know, this for me is a really recent past. There are previous literatures here around um, climate justice and environmental justice, uh, but certainly for me, energy justice is something that right now is about 10 years old. So you have uh, kind of key authors around Guruswami, who was one of the first people to use this terminology, but he did it in a very particular setting. Um, and he did it, in all fairness, you know, in slight passing. It was a term that was dropped, but never really developed. And so when I'm talking about the past, I'm specifically looking at, say, kind of 2015 onwards, where I think we have seen this kind of exponential growth um, and interest in energy justice. And for me, I couch that specifically within sustainable development. So as I mentioned, my background uh, was as SD um, undergrad. I also did my master's and my PhD in sustainable development. And so a lot of my thinking here is informed by those particular challenges and frameworks. And something that we do in our teaching here, and I think probably across the world, is refer to this as kind of a three-legged stool, or whatever you want to call it, where you have these kind of three tenets of social, economic and ecological sustainability. <clears throat> and it struck me as I went through my studies that, okay, we're talking about those a lot, but we're not really going into depth, and we're often forgetting um, the key question of kind of ethics and justice and the role that that plays in this. And so as I went through, it was an increasingly a concern of how do we make sure that, you know, the processes that we're going through towards sustainability uh, and the outcomes that we achieve actually fit this notion of justice. And how do we describe that and how do we come together um, to make decisions oriented towards it? So that sustainability framing, I think, is always there. The other framing that I think will never, ever go away um, is that of this kind of low carbon transition. The idea that we're at a moment in time where everything is ebbing and flowing, and I don't think that's ever not the case, but it's especially amplified now around these kind of uh, low carbon discourses and low carbon transitions, particularly in somewhere like California. <clears throat> and saying, you know, there there is a set of literature here around the transition that's happening. Uh, it's something that's well described by a large number of authors, uh, including people like Frank Eels, who's another famous name to look at. <clears throat> um, but that's not typically something, this transitions language, that's thought of alongside justice. I mean, it's mentioned in some of this writing that there's kind of this normative uh, question of where we're going with this transition and who the transition is for and what are the goals and visions that we're seeking to achieve. But it, it was never something that was made very explicit in my reading of that literature. And so with that sustainability, kind of lens and justice coming to the fore and also this interest in this transition um, that's widely described but I don't think often nailed down in depth. Um, it got me to the point of okay we really need to humanize the energy issues that we're looking at and working with. We need to describe these not in, only in terms of kind of technological shifts from renewable energy to fossils or the other way around or from um, solar to hydrogen whatever it, hydrogen whatever it is we actually need to think of this in terms of you know the people and the processes that are brought alongside that and when those debates are being had in parliament recognizing different groups um, that are included or excluded from that kind of process so that's the overall framing i guess and i find it interesting you know when we talk about these things and we had a brief discussion before this call around again around some of the background that you will have had as students and the fact that you'll have encountered different framings of equity was a word that came up um, but also justice and there are other terms here around fairness and democracy and when we humanize these issues all of those different things come up and it's actually quite a complex set of language so justice you know whenever I <laughs> tried to explain to my mum what on earth it, I was doing, she was pretty sure that I should be a lawyer um, and that I should be working with kind of uh, legal aspects and regulation and frameworks and all those kind of things and saying, no, just a social science scientist or a human geographer. Um, but, you know, that justice orientation does have something of law about it. It is around kind of moral rightness, um, a scheme or a system kind of due process due outcomes and so on and so forth. Whereas equity, fairness and democracy refer to slightly different things. 
So whilst I knew that this kind of broader framing existed, what we were really trying to do in the literature at this stage is say, okay, the socio-technical system is social and technical. That means humanizing issues, but it also means getting to grips with some of this slippery language around how we conceptualize um, what it is that we're trying to achieve and who we're trying to achieve it for. And the kind of next logical step was to think, right, so you can do that in one of two ways. Uh, you can have a definition, which is kind of what the first um, example shows, where you have perhaps the act of being morally right or fair and providing equal reward for equal merit. That's just one slightly dodgy, probably Google sourced definition of what ju justice might be, but it's equal easily really to problematize that and think okay that depends on so many different variables depends on context um depends on time that you're asking that so actually what we started to do with energy justice was not to think of it necessarily in terms of that definition but more in set of a framework so you have here the different tenants that you will probably quite quickly read about in the energy justice literature we have distributional justice recognition justice and procedural justice. And each of those asks kind of evaluative questions on what is the state of the world uh, at the moment? So where are the injustices? Who are they for? Who's responsible and is there a fair process? But also those difficult normative questions I alluded to um, at the very beginning around, okay, what, what is sustainable development? What is an energy justice future? How should we solve these problems? Who do we recognize? How do we achieve responsibility? And so on and so forth. And so that double framing helps you both take stock, but also imagine a future. Um, and I really, really liked that kind of beginning framework for energy justice. And it's certainly one that, as I'll go on to show, um, has been quite popularized. But before I get uh, to making the world clearer, I'm going to make it more messy for you um, and say that, you know, one of the terrible things about academia is everyone uh, proliferating a concept, finding their own niche, taking their own spin. And I've already referred to that, you know, with Tony and um, Tony Reams and Darren. Uh, Macaulay, Raphael Heffron, lots of key authors here having their own particular takes. And so you also have some authors working with energy justice in a slightly different way. And I call this the kind of octopus model, where here you have uh, eight different strands or legs um, of energy justice, where actually they are trying to put slightly more of that um, normative lens into action and say, if energy justice is anything, it's the following outcomes. It means that we have equal access. It means that it's affordable access. It means that we have due process where everyone's involved in the decision making at the right stage and so on and so forth. And so those kind of models sit, I guess, both intention and complementarity to each other. In one, on the one side, we're saying, you know, here's a framework to consider these issues. And here we're saying, and here are the issues that you should move towards going forward. And again, even more complicated, uh, you'll have further notions of kind of restorative justice, where we're saying this is transition isn't just something now, it's something that's happened in the past, it's something that's happening in the future. And for restorative justice in particular, we're looking at what has come before. So it might be the closure of coal mining facilities, for example. Uh, it might be, yeah, the shutdown of nuclear power stations in Germany and Japan at the time of the Fukushima accident um, and whatever it is to say, you know, those communities in the past have gone through something and they might deserve compensation and recognition or they might deserve upskilling and bringing on a journey uh, towards which new resources we use in the future. So there's a tenant there. Spatial justice, which is something that's, I think, quite uniquely British at the moment. Um, Stefan Bowserowski and Neil Som Simcock doing uh, interesting work, which would probably overlap with uh, Tony Reams and some of the stuff that he's doing on um, UN US inequalities and kind of access to energy at a domestic scale. Or you're saying that this is also something that's inherently geographic, um, cuts across different scalar levels. And then two at the end, which I won't go into into depth. But it's a useful point, I think, to again um, take stock on what it is to be academic. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, we could say here that it's fair that academics like confusing people, uh, that we might be a little bit evil, that we're developing all of these different frameworks to uh, 
make your lives as students or scholars difficult. Um, but also that there's something around academia where we are inherently, um, as colleagues and scholars, designed to create niches. We have to find something that defines ourselves and our contribution. And so <clears throat> energy justice may eventually end up flopping over and dying as someone chooses the next big thing and decide, decides to carve up their niche. But, you know, it something here around kind of academic process, but also how we carve through this um, entire process and make sense of a very busy and important, but also proliferating field and say, you know, what is it again that we're trying to do? Is it this constant process of carving niches, of proliferating scholarship, or is it really coming back to that interest again in sustainability, making the most um, of opportunities for the communities that we seek to re represent and ensuring that justice is something that's embedded? And so I think you have to go through these constant processes of reflection. And this is very much a comment on myself. There's something here too around recognizing that, you know, I do a lot of conceptual work in this area, but that's fairly detached from the communities, um, the real world that's kind of facing these everyday justice issues. And so we need to constantly reflect on who it is, who the voices are and how we engage with them um, as scholars. And it's, it's something that pushes, I think, the traditional boundaries of what it is to be an academic towards something perhaps that's more activist and engaged um, and everyday relevant. So, yeah, I'll reflect on the state of the literature there and say it's an important and crucial moment in time to think of what energy justice is, but also what it could be. And I've tried to simplify that process for myself and break it down into these tenants that I mentioned in this table. So for any of you that are familiar with environmental justice literature, these will be very kind of common approaches. But what we're saying first and foremost is that distributional justice is effectively a question of what, what it is that we're concerned about. Um, is it the technologies themselves or access to those technologies? And you think back here to kind of notions of environmental justice in 1970s America, where there were big outcries at the fact that a lot of toxic waste facilities were disproportionately placed next to ethnic minorities or uh, people with lower educational attainments or lower incomes. And think, you know, fundamentally that is unfair. So it's, also, it's a characteristic, uh, as I say, of the technologies themselves, but also our sighting of them and our access to them. And there's also something here I think that's quite interesting um, in terms of, you know, questioning not only should we all get access to the same things, um, which is fundamentally impossible, um, but also should we have access to less. So one way of thinking about this is, you know, first and foremost, we could say that we want to use wind energy. Um, across the entirety of the world, but that's that's fundamentally infeasible. It'll, it'll work in a lot of Scotland because we're super windy, of course, um, but it won't work in places where the wind doesn't blow. So there are technological constraints around how we might distribute things fairly. But there's also important questions here around, you know, are we seeking to achieve access up to the point of energy need? And if so, what is that need? And does that mean that we elevate everyone to the same level? Or should we also think critically about reducing high consumption um, amongst certain communities or certain countries so that we kind of equalize this distributional thing across all of us? And that, again, has very normative concerns. The second kind of logical step from there is you know, I would start in this process, as I say, by typifying what the issues are, but then following directly on from that, considering who they're an issue for. Um, and here you have justice as recognition as a tenant that thinks more in depth about that representation from different members of society. It starts to move a little bit towards who is and who is not included um, in different energy processes and decision making infrastructure. So a couple of photos here being very, very different um, examples. The the one at the top is the feet of the Sami reindeer tribe in northern Norway, Finland and Sweden, some of them uh, move into, who are facing uh, issues of Arctic energy expansion, but also kind of exclusion from those landscapes where a lot of that heavy infrastructure is not being rooted into those communities in terms of energy benefits. And it's coming right up against um, cultural challenges 
where there are practices like reindeer herding that would um, interact with the different pipelines and facilities. And I know that's something that's common in kind of Canada and Alaska as well. And then the bottom um, picture being a kind of more classic representation of someone who doesn't have access um, to energy and therefore um, has limited opportunities or has to work in a particular way in a particular schedule. So really this question of who is part of this process and who it is that's of concern, um, I think is absolutely fundamental. Not everyone includes that in their energy justice framing, but to be honest, I'm not sure how you can't. <laughs> um, the other thing there is, you know, it's justice for whom, but it's also justice by whom. So looking increasingly at notions of responsibility for some of these issues. And then the last one would be procedural justice for me. Um, the what, the who, and then the how in terms of, okay, you've identified these issues in the groups, uh, but what does it look like to have fair process, due process and engagement? Uh, how do we enact social engagement and which stakeholders are involved in you know which equitable procedures it might be that you have it through voting and godspeed to you all for your voting in the next few days i will hang my head in shame if it goes the way it did last time not gonna not gonna lie um <laughs> but also you know is it through uh, participation at a more local level around a particular site? Uh, is it through your election of your local representatives or is it through community energy schemes themselves uh, on a more localized level and through kind of devolving some of that ownership back towards those communities? Um, and that, of course, is a fundamental question in the transition. So that's my overall framing is those kind of three different elements. And of course, it's not easy. Um, there are a hell of a lot of tensions and trade-offs that sit across those different domains. Um, and one of them, you know, just as a very, very quick worked example, uh, she says conscious of time and promising to keep it as short as possible. Um, one of those would be, I think, a really interesting thing around, you know, cars um, and cobalt, um, which is an increasingly important case study. So we have uh, in the UK and of course uh, in wider areas, uh, attention to the Sustainable Development Goals. The sustainable Development Goal 7 saying that we'll promote investment in energy infrastructure and energy technology. And that is something that's framed as being fundamental to a low carbon transition. So we have this push towards kind of the new and innovative and in the UK, at least that means the gradual phase out of petrol and diesel vehicles uh, and the increasing integration of electric vehicles. And on the one hand, that makes complete sense for a low carbon transition. You can see absolutely all of the merits for that. Um, definitely some challenges to be faced as well. Um, but I think what's often forgotten here, and this comes back to my uh, whole systems framing, is the kind of ripple implications of that manoeuvre uh, for the rest of the world. So whilst we can evaluate this effectively in the UK and say, yes, pro-sustainability, low carbon, all sounds good, um, we also need to pay attention to the kind of upstream and downstream impacts of that policy. And this is where these kind of questions of justice get a lot more difficult. Um, but more important at the same time. So the picture that I put up here um, is taken in the Congo and it is of uh, rather unfortunately named or unfairly named artisanal miners, which makes it sound like it's something glamorous and <clears throat> bespoke, but actually it just means that, you know, the people involved in the process of cobalt extraction are often doing it by hand. Uh, and they're doing it in pretty unsafe conditions and they're doing it with a very toxic resource. And there's increasing literature here to say as well, actually it's typically done by children or the children carry um, a massive burden. And actually when you look at the statistics of um, the amount of cobalt that we're going to need to put into the lithium ion batteries that go in electric vehicles, it's enormous. Um, and these communities are kind of rapidly working to keep up the pace, but not doing so with safety infrastructure or due recognition um, in this system of promoting electric vehicles. And so you look at the tensions and trade-offs there already around, you know, recognition elements, procedure elements, and start to think why fundamentally aren't our systems linked up in a global scale so that we can think through those issues in the most productive way for society as a whole. 
and so it's not an easy, uh, adorable, irrelevant penguin intersection. Um, it's not an easy set of questions to be asking. But again, when I come back to kind of my core framing of energy justice and why I think it might be useful, um, it's because it's asking those conceptual questions, as I say, around uh, where are we, where do we want to go, and which kind of tenants are we included, uh, distribution, procedure and recognition, but it can also help us look uh, very empirically and analytically as at those current situations and think, what is happening? How do we describe this? Who do we describe it for? And, you know, what are the elements that are falling through the gap? And I do think those whole systems implications, which are true for many other energy sources, including wind energy um, and the resource mining that goes into that, or including uh, nuclear power or coal waste, um, we need to accurately describe those and account for those. And that brings you on to this kind of other element that we've said that energy justice is capable for, of, which is starting to think about, okay, if those are the issues that are existing, what are the decision-making processes that follow? How do we engage with the responsible actors that we've identified to start to make those energy justice issues sexy enough, perhaps, for business or for policy? Um, I say sexy, not just to drop an inappropriate word, um, but because I actually spoke to a, a policymaker in the uh, UK once that told me that energy justice wasn't sexy enough <laughs> and that they wanted something a little bit more tangible. Um, and so, you know, when we're working with our decision making um, structures here, we're looking at making it as accessible uh, and easy to engage with as possible. So that is effectively where I think we've got to in terms of the past. It's it's some of that deliberation, some of that reflection, um, and some of that, you know, structuring of how we look at those issues and the kind of claims that we're looking to make. And that takes us up to the present, uh, and the present being the very, very real um, <laughs> state of the art in that uh, myself and my colleagues are in the process of publishing. So this is a pre-publication insight, um, a paper that takes stock on kind of 10 years of energy justice literature so far, or 11 years, 12 years, however you count them. And so what I'm going to do now is just talk you very quickly through you know, what we know from energy justice so far um, and take stock of kind of who's writing in this area, where they're writing about technologies and people and so on and so forth. So what we've done here is, as I say, take a look at a, a block of time. Um, we've read in, in depth 155 uh, different articles that have come from different databases. Um, and what we're trying to do is kind of summarize the state of the art of the literature. It is more fun than it sounds, actually, engaging with all of that um, and doing that systematic reflection. And yeah, this is a sneaky preview of a paper, which I hope no one on this uh, channel is reviewing. If you are, I will send you chocolate and money. Um, <laughs> but hopefully it will be something that gets published soon. Oh, also Iron Brew and Fish and Chips, which my partner will deliver to me at some stage this evening. Um, but yes, OK, I'll start off by kind of going through some of the key key statistics that have come out of that, um, which I think are interesting on a number of levels. So when we talk about this kind of present of energy justice, uh, we're referring to, it would seem, a massive swathe of social scientists. And that's something really exciting. Um, so the journal that I work for, Energy Research and Social Science, uh, we are young. Um, we were set up um, on the, based on the work of Benjamin Sofakul to represent what he thought was an emerging and important field, um, which was this intersection, as I say, between socio-technical systems um, and the role of social science in kind of articulating the energy challenges um, of all time. And it seems that we've massively stepped up to that challenge. So social science um, and management disciplines in particular are contributing to this literature. Um, hopefully you can see the we uh, key that goes alongside that, the legend, clearly enough. But also, you know, a less of a input from this kind of interdisciplinarity, which we claim that we need uh, and that we claim that we have. Um, so you have, you know, for sustainable, sustainable development framing um, in particular, this claim towards this interdiscipline I can't say that word, just, you know, fill in the blank, uh, interdisciplinary uh, challenge and this uh, global challenge as some frame it, but we're not achieving that in the literature to date. 
Does anyone want to interrupt with a question? I've seen one one face pop up. No? Okay. Uh, the other thing, you know, is thinking about where our authorship is coming from. And this is where I call upon you to step up and raise your game as young scholars. Uh, because it would seem that a lot of our contributions to date are coming from Europe. Um, I think you can probably pick on a good few names at this stage and work out who the guilty culprits are in leading this literature from perhaps quite a uh, British-centric bias even. Um, but we have much less representation from uh, other areas outside uh, North America and Europe and, you know, slightly more from Australia and New Zealand. But again, if we're trying to kind of characterise these issues um, as a global challenge, then isn't it sad that we don't have more authorship coming from uh, areas like Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean? In terms of the way we're writing about this issue, um, I also think that's very interesting. So our results will show you that it's mostly in terms of kind of qualitative um, engagement where you have classic focus groups and interviews uh, being some examples, a little bit of ethnography, um, but much less in terms of uh, surveys or modeling, or again, <clears throat> some of those really important interdisciplinary skills, which might get us further towards that kind of um, description of what's happening, but also decision-making relevant um, engagement. And then the ever so beautiful table on the right hand side saying that, you know, this goes back to my uh, original slides on how we're conceptualizing what energy justice even is and different people frame it in different ways. It would seem that I'm winning the battle so far in the distribution procedure and recognition is the most common way of thinking about energy justice. And she says giving herself a promotion to professor just because of that. Um, but also that there is some of this diversity um, in terms of other approaches that are being used. And again, when we're thinking as the of this as kind of a community of scholarship, but also a community of concern for the kind of real world impacts. We need to think about what each of those different um, approaches are saying and the different biases that they're giving towards our characterization of these issues. Geographical case studies. I love this one. This is the most fun that you can have making a map. You can also do this online if you want to colour in all the places you've ever travelled to on your holidays. Um, but this is kind of a, a wee map that shows um, all of the case studies that we've used so far um, within the literature. It's a it's a bit of a crude figure to be fair because you know Russia is coloured red. <laughs> it's obviously a fairly enormous part of the world uh, and I know in fact that there are a few studies coming out of there. There's probably only one or two that consider the Russian case in depth. But nonetheless, it does show you where this literature is popping up as being of concern and definitely the enormous and slightly concerning blank spots um, around areas that haven't been considered, particularly when you think back to those different energy systems and uh, recognition challenges. So why, for example, is the vast majority of Africa um, not represented in terms of case studies of impact? Impacts when actually they've got some of the biggest concerns um, around recognition and access and uh, some of the biggest potential too in terms of technological systems development for solar and so on and so forth. And so again you can think quite critically in terms of where we might contribute in the future and filling in some of those gaps. Um, and I would do that with my own bias from a source to sink perspective um, to think about you know mining as I say all the way through to waste. And the waste as well being a really interesting example when we think of uh, international responsibility for energy systems and the fact that you've got countries uh, that are considering, for example, shipping nuclear waste to central Australia, even though they hardly use nuclear for energy production, they in fact mainly use it for uh, medical research purposes. So a lot of these systems cross massive areas of the world um, and thinking through those implications as I did very, very briefly in my cobalt case, and something that's totally fascinating. In terms of uh, technologies, we've called it technologies, infrastructures, and material systems, but really they come back to technologies. There's also something interesting here in terms of which ones are being mentioned for energy justice. Solar being the one that comes up in the vast majority um, of case studies, but also wind and heating and cooling. 
And it might be that those are appearing because they are systems that throw up the biggest kind of problems in terms of energy justice, or it could hopefully be things that are characterizing where we think the low, tran low carbon transition is going and the technologies that kind of might set the scene for the future. And so we're, we're reflecting on that within our piece um, in terms of, you know, which are the biggest players, um, which are the technological systems that have um, the biggest number of winners and losers. Um, and are we actually biasing the literature towards some technologies whilst neglecting others? Um, and I'm sure solar here would be something that on a day like this in Edinburgh, we're less concerned in, but you know, the Californian, uh, or realism of that is a slightly different um, endeavour altogether. So there we are in terms of technologies and infrastructures. And also, and this is where tiny, here's a good Scottish word for you, PD, as we would call it instead of tiny, a PD graph can be quite difficult to read on the other side of the world. Um, but we're also looking here at uh, the different communities um, that are of concern. The people that we're describing in the literature at the moment um, as being those that are marginalised or those that are the victims. We have, you know, a massive swathe of the literature dedicated towards low income poverty um, and economically marginalised groups. Um, people with limited ac access and disconnections. Um, disconnections being something it would seem apparently very common in the US and New Zealand uh, in terms of lack of availability and affordability um, and the different kind of tariff structures that are set up to bump people off effectively if you stop paying the bills. Local populations in host communities, so the communities around the sites of infrastructure themselves um, who are taking on even the burden of production or waste. And then there's a the next big group um, domestic households um, and how they're being engaged or disengaged in energy justice um, processes. So it's again a really interesting set of literature, for me at least, who's super geeky and enthusiastic about this, um, where you can start to think, okay, where are we putting our political priorities uh, for this transition? Who is fairness actually for? And are there any groups on that? Um, graph just there that are underrepresented that we really ought to think more about um, and one of those kind of bigger trends in the literature um, at the moment is really around women and gender and so you might see that jump um, as being a particularly important concern and racial and ethnic minor minorities as well uh, coming up more and more and then more positively um, and this goes back to my, my third adorable pen penguin on my slide where you're looking at um, the impacts of the decision-making potential of energy justice. We've also got a set of findings here around um, what is thought to be potentially useful. Uh, it's here flagging up that, you know, there's a different focus on um, financial structures, so compensation for particular communities, tariff investment to protect the vulnerable in terms of disconnections, um, the different incentivization schemes for different technologies that are perceived to be more socially just than others, um, those being applied primarily in a local context, and a real focus on doing that around um, fair procedures where you have you know collaborative decision making and where stakeholder engagement is uh, more widely conceived than it is at the moment so <clears throat> that takes me to kind of where we are the present i guess and then and i don't know how much time i have left i think you said not a lot <laughs> um but i will do a very quick kind of where i think the future of this is because um, I think that's probably the most exciting bit and hopefully where you guys can contribute and uh, challenge me in some of your work. And so I've alluded to um, uh, several times, it's one of my, my favourite things, my hobby horse almost, um, is this challenge of um, whole systems governance where, you know, the, the way that we're working with energy technologies is typically very nationally centric. So we're looking to protect 
our communities, our stakeholders, our citizens. And definitely, I think you can see a lot of that in kind of US discourse at the moment. But that's at times at odd with the way in which this at odds rather the way in which the systems themselves operate so it's very rare to have an energy system that's only bounded by a national context and therefore the groups that you're going to be advantaging or disadvantaging are spread beyond that And so what I'm really pushing for um, in the literature and is my overall contribution to life beyond uh, a llama farmer is to try and conceive of this uh, network of kind of internationally relevant whole systems governance where you can account for some of those um, international dynamics in your energy decision making, where, for example, in the UK, we make a decision that actually we're going to do our electric vehicles in a very different way because we don't want to be involved with that process of cobalt mining and artisanal mining um, where we might you know focus on a different technology as hydrogen for example um, because that is a more localized source without some of those negative externalities and so yeah there's something here around conceptualizing that there's something here around mapping it but i think more importantly and more challengingly um is something for actually making this real <laughs> um and for getting that accountability built into our uh, energy policy and for getting that um level of vision built into the way in which we conceive of these issues so i set you the challenge of please resolving that the second one is uh, around smart energy futures. Um, definitely in the UK at the moment, this is something of a hot topic. Um, and I think it is everywhere, you know, even in my lifetime, although I'm resisting it at the moment, my phone has gone from making uh, text messages to turning on my heating and controlling it from the office so that when I get back, it's warm enough. Um, and even our homes will take on this uh, different role in the future where we're going to be prosumers, where our house will pursue, produce the energy that we might use within it or where we're hooking up electric vehicles um, as a kind of charging cell for our own houses. And that has massive implications um, in terms of ownership and recognition for justice issues, um, but also, you know, who's excluded in this process. So I'm thinking, as always, and I always give her a, a mention in any of my presentations of my legendary granny, um, who doesn't even know what the internet is, um, <laughs> and is definitely horrified by the notion of someone kind of watching from a smart meter um, or whatever it is, and how we engage with those different communities that are being taken on this process where a home becomes something entirely different. It becomes something that's not just perhaps your own bubble, but that's being watched by a variety of different um, technical interfaces to track how you're using your energy um, to change when your appliances turn on and turn off and to think even beyond that you know when you're driving at one point in the day and so yeah as I say justice issues in that setting um, are altogether different but ultimately something that we need to be very conscious of um, it might even be that our houses literally start watching us so that when we're elderly and we fall over, uh, they can intervene in some way. And that has massive um, implications in terms of digital security, for example. And then I think this is my penultimate one, and I've uh, reflected on this, or maybe my ultimate, we'll see, it'll be a surprise if there's one more slide to you as, as it will be to me. Um, <laughs> but, you know, notions of responsibility here. I've talked a lot about uh, different marginalised groups and this is something that you know we flagged up very empirically from our data but we really need to be thinking about who is responsible for achieving justice. Uh, is it the government? Is it Donald Trump as he is there in Lego form? Um, is it industry? Is it the business makers, the lawyers um, or wider society as a whole? Um, and again, here you can think of the kind of future generations with my Lego baby um, as being someone that's got to be very much implicated um, in our understanding of uh, social justice and in carrying forward the legacy that we leave. Um, and that legacy, again, being perhaps a sustainability oriented one. It wasn't my final slide. Surprise. <laughs> uh, then my last kind of um, next big thing, I think, um, is exactly around that, is describing what it is that we want for an energy justice future. 
what it is that sustainability actually looks like. You know, we can do these exercises at a number of levels. You can do it in your class uh, or in your thesis or dissertations, uh, whatever it is that you call them in the US. Um, you can do it on kind of a local or a national or an international level, but it constantly needs to be updated. It constantly needs to be something that we are articulating very explicitly. What are the goals here? Is it low carbon purely in terms of um, a number of CO2 reduction? Um, is it net zero, where it's even more ambitious than low carbon? Um, is it sustainability with an economic focus? Whatever it is, we need to get to grips with how we articulate that and constantly evaluate um, our progress towards those goals. And as part of that, you need to compete again with um, different ideas that are coming on at any time and one of them might be the just transition which takes on a slightly different focus to energy justice uh, in its primary kind of orientation towards labor forces but has some of the same concerns and is being taken up in a different uh, political way by organizations like uh, the united i think i might have just accidentally uh -huh. muted myself Hopefully you can. <laughs> a classic fail. Um, United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change, who are using this language of the just transition uh, in particular. So those are kind of uh, the big next steps, I think, in terms of energy justice, uh, is getting to grips with some of that. And I do hope that, you know, as a class, uh, you can continue to ask some of those kind of existential questions and engage with some of those challenges um, for the betterment of uh, the literature and the community as a whole. So I have no idea how I did on time, but I'll leave it there with a picture of my uh, energy justice mascot uh, and open it to questions from the floor. <laughs> Kristen, thank you so much. I see lots of applause symbols popping up in place of actual <laughs> claps. Um, and you did perfectly on time. We recommended talking to 11:30 so you're 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 right on time um, uh, I would like to open it to the floor we'll do what we usually do and I, I see we have a lot of participants uh, many more than our normal seminar um, and so just to let you guys know usually um, please use the hand raising function and I will try to call on people as as I see their hands come up and you're welcome to use the chat function as well um, and I will monitor the chat function and try to move between um, live questions and chatted questions all right so um, Please, anyone who'd like to, to raise their hand, do so, and, and I'll start moving through those. You can ask me a question about my future llama if you feel the need. That's also <laughs> relevant. <laughs> All right, I'm going to start with uh, with Reese, and then we'll move to Meg. Um, Awesome. Uh, first of all, thanks for that talk. That was really great. I um, really appreciate it. Uh, one, one thing I was thinking about when you kind of talked about the global scale of energy systems and thinking about energy justice and that scale, it, do you think that um, kind of trying to localize energy systems as much as possible makes it easier to like center energy justice in policy? Is there is there an energy justice benefit from trying to make energy systems more local and tangible? Mm. This is a really interesting question because it's not all that long ago in kind of human history that that's the state of the world, right? So even if you look at um, kind of northern communities in Scotland, there's still a few that use kind of micro hydro, um, that use wind turbines, or that would be kind of dependent on resources like peat, which I, to be fair, do not know if that translates to a US context. Um, <laughs> you've all heard of peat? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so it's it's not all that long ago that we, we had the bounds of that as kind of localized concerns um, and localized modes of pr production and consumption, but we've clearly gone through this process um, within society of massively upscaling and our energy systems have had to keep pace with that. Um, and so you can easily think, you know, there will be some things um, that we will not be able to do if we then choose to relocalize again. So, you know, using the example of electric vehicles, you know, there are many places in the world that don't have access to that resource of cobalt, which is important for the batteries. And equally, you know, there are many places in the world that wouldn't have um, resources around uranium for the production of nuclear power, 
to produce baseload energy, um, which is important for you know everyone being able to watch uh, the TV when the football's on and that kind of thing. So. I think if we were to relocalize, yes, it does make a hell of a lot of sense in terms of um, accounting for some of those justice dynamics, but it would also mean a massive deal or, you know, level of human sacrifice um, in terms of coming away from some of what we've been used to. Um, I can see perhaps, you know, interesting geographical dynamics around this as well. Um, again, to talk about the best country in the world, as an example, you know, we have island communities here and you would in Denmark, um, for example, that are self-sustaining. And for them, that's possible because of the resources that they have around uh, wind, tidal, nuclear, not nuclear, sorry, that was ridiculous, uh, wind, tidal, uh, solar and wind and all of those kind of things. Um, that, that is possible. But if you're looking at a community like London um, or perhaps some of the bigger cities that you have uh, over in the US, the idea of them being feasibly localized is a lot more challenging technologically. So yeah, a very elaborate way of saying ideologically, I think it would be brilliant, but practically in terms of uh, the technologies and human sacrifice, I think it's not necessarily something that we can achieve. So until that is the case, and we might get there as the world burns around us through climate change, um, we might have to, you know, continue to work with these international globalised energy systems. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, thank you so much. This is a really fantastic presentation. Uh, so the students in our program are kind of a mix of some social science, but I would say more of us have sort of an engineering natural mm -hmm. science background. And I'm curious you, if you have any advice on for students who are looking to publish work in more traditional technical or engineering um, areas. Kind of what are maybe how can they center justice in their research and then maybe what are some problematic practices in traditional energy research that students should watch out for mm. yeah it's an interesting question so i mean how do i go about this there are i think increasingly a risk um that when we talk about interdisciplinarity we do it in a very tokenistic sense so we for example uh, as a social science scholar i've increasingly been asked to be part of um, big proposals where we <laughs> uh, come on as the social scientist that does just kind of one little aspect of the work where you know there is this whole engineering system set up to design the technology and uh, to look at the feasibility of it and so on and so forth and then you bring in the social scientist at the very last minute to say but what about the people that will eventually use it so that would be my kind of primary problematic practice um, would be not thinking of it in terms of a more holistic interdisciplinarity um, <clears throat> and there are you know energy justice literature here overlaps interestingly with other um, perspectives around say responsible research and innovation um, or value sensitive design which are literatures that classically sit more closely to engineering and even to um, information technology and so what they would ask you to do as an engineer um, would be to consider perhaps the value orientation of your work you know think who is it being designed for which values are embedding is it about kind of constant affordable access is it as much energy as possible is it you know taking um attention to some of those kind of international resource dynamics or is that not at all to do with it and by asking those value laden questions um early on that kind of energy engineering and natural science um approach i think you can truly embed some of that social science thinking so i'd very much encourage you um to do it in that way and to look at those literatures as somewhere to start um on how to make that more practical but yeah is it i feel like that's a rubbish answer <laughs> no not rubbish satisfactory i'll think about it more and i'll maybe get back to you on that one as well but yeah it it is an ongoing challenge um and it is it's one as well that's not just you know faced by kind of every scholar or student working in this area but actually by the systems themselves so you'll find that funding bodies um, 
can at times be quite resistant to that kind of revolutionary thinking that you might include social science as being uh, inherently important to all stages of the process and not just to the um, final implication of your study. Um, and so it, it's as much a process of challenging our own thinking as it is where we work, uh, who we work with and how we're funded in order to do that. Um, you might find particular journals interesting, like Applied Energy, um, to mention one of the competitors where, you know, they are slightly more natural science focused, but they also have uh, embedded social science along that. But yeah, it's a good question and an ongoing challenge. Right. Um, Alex, do you still have a question? Um, yeah, I can ask it. Um, first, <laughs> thank you for a great presentation. Um, I have a kind of more direct question for your mm -hmm. global lit review. I thought that's a fantastic idea. And I was wondering if you had um, run into any issues with um, English speaking bias or identifying uh, publications not in English and if that affected any of, you, any of your geographical efforts. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, we wholeheartedly have to admit our limitation there. So I often make the joke that I speak English badly, but it's true. I speak Scottish English um, <laughs> and no other languages as a failing of my upbringing. So, you know, when we were doing our study, we, we limited it quite explicitly to English language only publications. And we also limited it to the eight databases that I mentioned. Um, and they are unfortunately by their nature, ones that tend to be quite exclusionary they often you know include journals that publish only in english and there is also a massive issue around the world at the whole time of um many authors from different uh, developing countries don't have equal access to those journals they don't have subscription or they can't afford the fees in order to publish within them so yeah i will be uh, quite open and admit that yes there may be um other papers there that we didn't capture within our sample. Um, but I'll also say a little bit around uh, what it is to publish and some of the work that we're doing um, in the journal Energy Research and Social Science, which is every year we keep um, data on who is publishing from where um, and do some of that mapping around which countries aren't as involved as we would like them to be. Um, and we do have kind of dedicated outreach then directed towards um, it's, it sounds awful, but expansion into those areas um, so that we can get kind of more Asian authorship, for example, and more African authorship. Um, so yeah, again, an elaborate way of saying it's a fault of our study, but it's also, I think, a fault of our um, system in academia as a whole, that we can't achieve that representation. Great, Good thank question. you. No problem. Are you one of the reviewers for our article? <laughs> uh, I have a question here from um, from Yemi um, mm -hmm. that he's put into the chat. So I will um, I will read that. Um, Thank you for the presentation. The um, SDG seven is ambitious and appears to be a good goal. How do you think mm. developing nations can grapple with poverty and supplying modern and sustainable energy for for all her citizens? Well, wow. <laughs> that's kind of an enormous question. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to write it down before I lose my train of thought. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, it's again one of the fundamental challenges of all time. Um, there is an interesting dynamic here around, of course, um, legacies legacies in terms of carbon emissions um, and the difference that some countries have produced in the past. So, for example, to be very explicit, you have the US doing terrible things and the UK doing terrible things. And I s therefore think in terms of emissions, one of the biggest questions here um, is around are developing countries afforded the same opportunity in terms of emitting? Um, or are we forcing them to have a clean trajectory that in the past we didn't take? Um, <clears throat> and there's a huge normative question here around, you know, what kind of future are we letting um, that part of the world um, develop? And actually, 
you know, when I say are we, I'm, I mean that there's still quite a lot of meddling uh, going on in those settings. So you have kind of big donations being made by uh, energy companies that are owned in the global north, if you can call it that, and it's a very crude distinction, or you have kind of big investment from uh, development and aid, so we can call it, um, countries and organisations. So China, for example, is pouring a huge amount of money um, into some African areas uh, in order to develop infrastructure there. So yeah, I'll summarise those points as <clears throat> first being, you know, a question of carbon emissions and what we think is reasonable and allowable um, and the rights that we afford to countries to develop dirty and quick, um, but also <clears throat> the process of energy for whom and who it's directed by in terms of international interests, um, finance um, and industry. And so we have to get to grips with, you know, the developing uh, world is not necessarily being um, as free and easy as it would, as I would like it to be, um, to shape its own energy future. But putting aside kind of those different vested interests and tensions, I think it's also really exciting to think of the potential. And this comes back to Reese's question in terms of, you know, is it a localized energy system or is it um, a nationalized one? Um, are we kind of thinking of these energy futures as being something that's truly state of the art and a, a way of running energy systems that we haven't conceived of before, where perhaps it's not even monetized, it's done um, <clears throat> on some kind of skill sharing or um, resource sharing capacity, where it becomes a completely different um, way of trade. Are we, as I said, uh, looking at different technologies in this setting where solar takes on um, its own characteristics and becomes something new or hydrogen is used. So it's not a question I can answer now <laughs> um, due to the scale of it, but I do think, as you've kind of touched upon, it's a really fascinating one in terms of thinking where we're coming from, who's part of the process, but also what that energy future might look like and how we engage with um, these different kind of visions and normativity around, you know, which values are we representing in that setting, which family dynamics are we looking to support, which rights of education and access, and being part of those discourses um, as a community of scholars and also very much representing the interests and values of um, people from that part of the world is a really exciting area to be looking. So um, yeah. thank you. Yeah, um, I'm going to read one more. It seems like we have a lot of people asking questions through chat, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, there's one, an, another one here from um, Madalena who asks, um, could you expand more on overlaps and differences between energy justice and just transition? Do you think the just transition co concept has been more sexy for pol policymakers? Glad someone else is using the sexy word. Um, <laughs> yeah, so energy justice, you know, let's take it as what I've described at the moment. We'll go with that kind of whole systems, uh, large scale framing where you're looking at um, <clears throat> myriad different technologies and contexts and social groups. The just transition um, has a slightly different um, history. I think on one hand, it would be oriented towards kind of labor forces um, and very explicitly from the movement for fossil fuels to renewable energy technologies. And that's something that, you know, is enshrined within uh, European Union thinking and through things like the Paris Agreement, where it's used as a particular piece of language to look at labor forces, to think of reskilling, protection of jobs. Um, and again, through m myriad different unions across the world. But what we're seeing at the moment in the literature um, is something of a conceptual slippage, um, which I think is quite problematic, where some people are taking the just transition away from what is a politically sexy um, area and what is kind of quite clearly defined in terms of a scope of uh, communities and technologies and using it in this much broader sense. Um, so one example of this would be an article by um, colleagues of mine Raphael Heffron and Darren McCauley, where 
they say that the just transition is this much more holistic lens that can take in energy justice, climate justice, environmental justice, and kind of synthesize them into this one ginormous perspective. Um, <clears throat> and I would be quite critical of that, I think. And it's fine. I like them. They're friends. Um, <laughs> I think that does a kind of a massive injustice to the literature and also to the communities that they've um, sought to serve at different points. And so here I begin to kind of argue for different, for clarity um, amongst some of our language intentionality in the way in which we use it. Um, and in everlasting kind of recognition of the groups that it's meant to serve. Um, and so, yeah, protecting the just transition in the way that it is sexy at the moment seems particularly important, especially when we're looking at phase out of kind of coal, oil and gas uh, for some of those communities, for example. So yeah, the distinction is there, it's getting muddy, but I think it should go back to the way it was. <laughs> All right, any, any other final questions? Well, excellent. Um, before giving a, another final uh, virtual just symbolic applause, um, I'd like <laughs> to remind um, seminar uh, students who are enrolled in the seminar are welcome to join um, afterwards again. Um, Ali uh, posted a link in the chat in case you guys are interested in signing up and getting the Zoom link for that. Um, and uh, um, and so uh, anyway, hopefully we'll we'll see you there. Um, in the meantime, let's thank uh, uh, Professor Jenkins again for such a wonderful um, talk, and hopefully some of us will see her in a moment. All right. Thank you very much. Everyone. Excellent. Okay. Thank you.